So here's a map um, of Ukraine. Uh, you can see Ukraine within the context of, um, of kind of Eastern Europe. Everything to the right, uh, as you look at the map, everything to the east is Russia. Uh, you can see uh, north is Belarus. Uh, next to Belarus, of course, is Russia to the north. Poland is to the west, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Moldo Moldova. But you can see Ukraine is also a big country. This is not a small country. Uh, just uh, look at the distance between uh, Kiev and Lviv in the west, Kiev and uh, Kaki, uh, um, yeah, Kiev and uh, Donetsk in the east, uh, or, or, or down to Gerson or Odessa in the south. So you can see the red uh, segments here. Uh, the, the red with black outline uh, are areas that the Russians took in 2014. Uh, both Crimea, that's in the bottom in the south, and on the east there, uh, Donetsk, which uh, is an area that the Russians took in 2014, and there's been kind of on and off battles over there since 2014, really. The rest of the web, the red with red outlines, is areas that the Russians have uh, taken uh, during this war. Of course, this is uh, what they took um, in this war only post they retreat from Kiev. So we, what we're not seeing here is what they took and then the, the, the um, uh, Ukrainians pushed them out of, which is the area around Kiev and the area in the very northeast of Ukraine, uh, which you kind of I'm hiding uh, in the map, which they had originally invaded. Um, the blue here are areas in which uh, the Ukrainians so far have uh, taken back from the, from the Russians. So these are areas which uh, the, uh, where the uh, Ukrainians have pushed the Russians back, including up to about 24 hours ago. So this includes a segment uh, that, that, uh, that was recaptured by the Ukrainians uh, about 24 hours ago. It doesn't include what has been happening since then. I'll try to fill you in in terms of what's been happening since. Oh, wait, so we're going to move the map around, map around a little bit so you'll... Uh, um, tolerate this we're going to put this in the center and we're going to we're going to grow this so you can we can zoom in so uh, uh, let, let's first look at this right um so here you have uh the basic uh region of the war you can see in the in the south uh you can see this city called kherson which is occupied by the russians this is the area where you see the blue outline here in the bottom this is the area in which the uh ukrainians have uh, been fighting over the last few weeks where they announced that they were launching an offensive. Uh, this uh, map doesn't reflect Ukrainian advances because the Ukrainians are not advertising and the Russians are not declaring uh, what is actually going on. Whatever advances are happening here are very, very, very uh, uh, are slow so far. However, one thing you can't see in this map, unfortunately, is just under Gerson, just south of Gerson, there's a river, a river that goes to the Black Sea in the west and goes up uh, uh, through the east. That is the river that you've been hearing about where the Ukrainians have been bombing all the bridges. Bombing all those bridges prevents the Russians from continuously bringing in new troops into the Gerson area. I, uh, my guess is that everything north of that river, including the city of Gerson, will fall to the Ukrainians within weeks, maybe sooner than that. Um, and then it's just a question of uh, the Ukrainians figuring out how to cross the river or figuring out how to attack that region uh, from the north. There's even fear among Russian military bloggers. These are people, uh, these are Russian nationalists who are writing about the war and are very critical of Putin because they think he hasn't been tough enough and they think that the uh, Russian military is, is disgracing uh, the nation. Uh, there is even fear that the Ukrainian army could um, attack Crimea and retake Crimea. Let me just show you Crimea quickly. That is Crimea, that, uh, that segment. So what has happened is, is over the last couple of months, the Russians have been pulling troops from the east and moving them to the Gerson area uh, to back up troops over there. And, 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 and many of the troops have been, so uh, they've been stationed here in the south. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, are using uh, long-range U.S. missile launchers and artillery, uh, precision weapons, to basically take out the bridges 
the uh, logistical supply routes. They've even bombed uh, through <coughs> special forces operations. They bombed uh, major logistical centers in Crimea itself. They've been under undermining uh, Russian uh, logistics in the south uh, for weeks now. This has only intensified Russia's certainty that the attack was going to come from the north, uh, and therefore they've been pulling troops from the Kharkiv area, from the uh, north of Do uh, Donetsk, uh, to the south in order to reinforce their troops there. Uh, that has been going on, as I said, for weeks, and uh, that has weakened the Russian presence in the east. Now, no, Russia has a real problem finding troops. By some estimates, this war has cost the Russians 50,000 troops. 50,000. That's a lot of people to replace. And they just don't have them. They're trying to recruit all over without declaring, without declaring a, a draft. Putin is very afraid of a draft. So uh, they're trying to recruit volunteers. They're not getting a lot of volunteers. They're recruiting volunteers primarily and paying a lot of money for the volunteers, primarily in some of the ethnic minorities that Russia controls. We'll talk about those ethnic minorities uh, uh, later. But the um, problem there is maybe they are going to come and fight, but they're not motivated. They don't care. They have no connection to Ukraine. So the quality of the troops is very low in addition to everything else. I just want to zoom in here on the south a little bit. Let's see if we can zoom in and maybe see that. Maybe if I zoom in, it'll show the river. Uh, the internet's slow. Move. All right, there we go. Zoom. Yeah, it won't zoom in more than that. All right, we'll skip that. We're going we're gonna to go east. Zoom in more here. Huh. All right, there we go. That's better zoom. All right. Uh, now we want to zoom out. <laughs> Whoops. This is all over the place. Sorry, guys. All right. Here is the city of Kharkiv. Now, what's interesting about the city of Kharkiv is in the early days of the war, uh, that was a major focus of the Russians. They tried to take the city. And they failed. It was one of the early failures of uh, the war uh, for the Russians. They could not take the city. The city held. And you can see the Russians occupied all the way to the ring road that circles the city. But they couldn't break into the city. Since then, the Ukrainians have been pushing the Russians back and back and further back. Uh, to the point where in some areas, they pushed them all the way back uh, to the Russian border. You can see that in the, uh, in the north here you can see that the blue uh, is reaching all the way to the Russian border. What's happened in the last few days is that, the Russia, that uh, from Kharkiv, um, the Ukrainians have pushed southeast, um, and they have uh, advanced southeast at a rapid pace. They've basically taken 3,000, over 3,000, maybe it's up to 5,000 uh, square kilometers uh, just over the last two to three days. Um, and they have slowly pushed the Russians back. And what this does, what this blue area here that you can see, particularly the portion that is kind of curving in towards the city called Iz Izium, what this has done is it's cut off the supply roads that the Russians were supplying the, the, the troops at the front in Izium and everything to the south and to the west of Izium, all the way down to a city a town you can see in the bottom here by the name of Lyman, L-Y-M-A-N. You can see it down in the center of your screen um, on, on kind of the, the center uh, uh, down in the south. Now, what's happened since this map was made, that is what has happened in the last 24 hours or less, maybe in the last 12 hours, is that Izium and Lyman have both fallen to the Ukrainians. That is, the Russians have retreated from both of those towns. And indeed, it looks like the, this highway, you can see it here labeled N26, uh, that, they have, uh, that they've reached that highway. And you see this city here called Svotev. 
uh, they, they might, rumors have it, no confirmation yet, that they reached Svotev, which basically would cut off all of the Russians to the west, and including many of the supply lines to the south. All right, so I don't remember if, if you heard uh, that I said that uh, since this map was made, the Ukrainians have taken Izium and they've taken uh, Lehman, uh, which are two very strategic locations and represent kind of the Western push that the, that the Russians were making. But it's more than just a Western push. Let me zoom out a second and give you a sense of what's going on here. What you get from the Izum and the Lehman locations is that the Russians were hoping to drive south from there and basically be able to cut off the Ukrainian military and, 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 and surround it and destroy it. And instead, what has happened is the exact opposite. Instead, what has happened is that the Ukrainians have now taken Izum and Lehman. And as a consequence of that, um, all of this area, all the way to Svatov, which is uh, right in the center of your screen there, um, is now maybe, probably, we will see uh, occupied by the Ukrainians. You know, rumors have it that the Ukrainians are already at Svatov, um, but we don't have confirmation. In, in, with respect to Lehman and with respect to, um, uh, with respect to Lehman and with respect to Izum, we have confirmation from the Russians themselves telling us that the Ukrainians have already captured that area. Uh, what this means now is that much of the red, much of the red at the top part here is now blue, and uh, that the Ukrainians are in the process of pushing the Russians to the Russian border and, uh, and, and freeing up all of Kharkiv province. Next, we're looking at the, at the red area to the south of that. Uh, the, you see the city, uh, Lyschansk, 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 something like that. Um, there is already, again, rumors or, or some data suggesting that the Ukrainians are pushing towards that city. That is a city that the Russians took, what, about two months ago in a major battle, and it was considered a major victory for the Russians. It looks like the Ukrainians are making a concerted effort to push to that city and to recapture it. Slowly, I think what you're going to see is this red on the top here turning into blue. And ultimately, what you'll also see is the, um, uh, oops, the southern front turning in Ukraine's favor. So uh, this is the turning point. Uh, it's a major turning point, I think. This is the first time, uh, other than the retreat of the, of the Russian army from Kiev, and from the rest of the very northeast. Since then, this is the first time the Ukrainians have made significant progress, fast progress. Um, up until now, the war has been more of a, a war of uh, uh, a, a kilometer here, a kilometer there. Uh, we're talking about three to 5,000 uh, square kilometers liberated by the Ukrainians uh, and, um, and, and uh, where, the, where the Russians have been defeated. Uh, this is a turning point in the war. I think it's a turning point in Russia's confidence. Um, this is a rout, as it looks right now. Again, fog of war, who knows what will happen tomorrow. But it certainly looks that way right now. Uh, it looks like the Ukrainians are kicking ass. Um, and um, the question now is, how does this play out? What happens next? Right. What happens next? Um, all right, let's see. Um, let's cut off. We don't need the map anymore. So what happens now really depends on, uh, you know, a few things. One is um, uh, the continued, uh, to what extent can the Ukrainians continue this momentum on the ground? To what extent uh, is this a, uh, is, is, is Russia going to fold? Uh, how much of a fight are they willing to put up? Are the, are the Russian soldiers motivated to fight? Are the Russian colonels, are the Russian generals motivated to fight? At least the generals and the colonels who are still alive. Uh, to what extent uh, is Russia really um, able to, willing to uh, continue to fight this war? And to what extent uh, is, uh, uh, is it all just going to fail? 
And in that sense, the second part of this really is, what is Moscow going to do? That is, what is Putin going to do? Or what are the people around Putin going to do? Can Putin survive what appears to be a Russian loss? Can, uh, can his regime survive by just replacing Putin and putting something else in his place? If Putin is replaced and Putin doesn't survive, who replaces him? Is it somebody more liberal, somebody more nationalist, who's going to spend the next few years building up the Russian military and spending gazillions of dollars on that? What is the trajectory from Russia from here forward? Uh, this is, of course, going to determine everything in terms of uh, the future. This is uh, uh, very difficult to, to, to estimate. I don't know enough about the internal politics within Russia to say. But I will say this, and I've been saying it for months now, but I will say this. Russia as a country is in massive decline. And this is just one more data point reflecting that decline. The Russian economy is a, was a mess before the war. The Russian economy is an unmitigated disaster as a consequence of the war, as a consequence of sanctions, and as a consequence of Putin's authoritarian uh, government. Demographically, Russia is a shrinking country. It is a country with a shrinking population. Not only have almost 500,000 of Russia's best people left since the war began, but Russia just, Russians just don't have kids. R Russians are having kids at a rate of maybe 1.2, 1.4, which is far below replacement cost, and basically involves a significant shrinking of the country. Russia is an aging population. The generation born after World War II in the optimism generated from the victory over the Germans, combined with the with, with Stalin's horrific dictatorship, that generation is dying off. There are not a lot of young Russians. And again, young Russians have been leaving Russia for decades now. Much of Russia is composed of ethnic groups. Russia is a very multi-ethnic society. I know people have this image of Russians uh, particularly kind of the, 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 the new right of, of Russia representing, you know, white power or whatever. Uh, Russia, is a very, Russia is a very diverse country. East of the Urals is Asia, occupied by Asians who look physically more like Chinese or Mongolians than they do uh, Europeans. South of Russia, uh, the Caucasus and other places, uh, uh, filled with all kinds of ethnic groups, including many Muslims. Russia has a relatively large Muslim population. Uh, many of these ethnic groups don't like being part of Russia. I'll give you just one example of this. Chechnya. You probably all heard of Chechnya. Russia has fought two wars with Chechnya. I wonder if we can see Chechnya on this map. Um, see if we can see Chechnya on the map. Chechnya would be on the other side. All right, we'll find Chechnya in a minute. But um, yeah, there's, there, there it is. Um, the other republics. All right, here's, uh, here's a map. Let me, let me give you the map again. Oh, there's Tucker. That's not it. There's the map. Uh, just to give you a sense of where this is, we'll go up. There's Ukraine, there's Crimea, right? You can see them at the way top left over there. And then you've got these, uh, these uh, uh, plains, which are part of uh, southern Russia. You've got the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea on the left, the Caspian Sea on the right. 
And then you've got these mountains here with uh, Georgia on the other side of the mountains, Armenia and Azerbaijan on the other side of the mountains. But on those foothills, everything close to in those mountains that goes from the Black Sea to the Caspian Sea, those are small little republics. You can see the Republic of Adyeja and uh, Cherkis and uh, uh, North Ostesia, that used to be part of Georgia, and the Russians took it. The Republic of Dagestan, uh, and, and we can we can uh, oops we can push it uh, further down. You can see the Republic uh, republics in the north here, and Chechnya is in here among these republics. And the Russians have fought two wars in Chechnya. Chechnya is Muslim, and the Chechens want independence. The Chechens don't want to be part of Russia. The Chechens wanted independence, and they fought two wars to establish independence. Uh, some of those wars, the Chechens basically uh, were fighting on the side of the Islamists, um, and, uh, and were basically the Chechens were represented uh, the Islamists. But a big part of it was nationalism, was the idea that we, they wanted to be separate from Russia. They wanted their own state. Uh, Russia expended huge amounts of resources, huge amounts of resources in people, in weapons, in arms, in order to defeat the Chechens. Ultimately, the only way they could defeat the Chechens is by, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, finding allies within the Chechens who would fight the, 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 the people who are not the allies, so finding divisions among the Chechens and utilizing those. But Russia fought a bloody long war over Chechnya. Now imagine the Chechens sitting back today and thinking, huh, the Russian military is depleted. It's folding. It is retreating. The Russians are fully occupied in Ukraine. This would kind of be a good time maybe for us to assert our nationalist desires. They're not all radical Islamists. Some of them are, right? And, and uh, some of them are, and it's not clear how many of them, and it's not clear what percentage, but some of them certainly were. But the Chechens could decide this is a good chance to try to establish independence. So could a lot of other parts of Russia use this opportunity to assert their independence, to separate themselves from Russia. This could be, this could be a time, an opportunity, basically for the breakup and the dissolution of Russia. I don't know that that's going to happen. That's pretty radical. It would be pretty amazing if it happened. It would completely destroy that particular power base uh, within Europe, and I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. For those of us who care about the Western civilization. But in any case, the defeat of the Russian army in Ukraine is not going to be limited to there. People are going to learn from it, think of it, and take advantage of it. And uh, Russia could be, this could just be the beginning of what could land up being much, much more trouble for Russia. Again, economics really bad, war before the war, worse today. Demographics, really bad, war before the war. You just killed and maimed tens of thousands of Russians. That only makes it worse. And now militarily Russia's been defeated. Europe and the rest of the world is finding alternative sources of natural gas than Russia. Russia is in deep, deep trouble and will be in deep, deep trouble for years and decades to come. The question, of course, is if Putin survives or if he's replaced by an even more nationalist leader, what does Russia do? 
Does it out of desperation use a tactical nuke? Does it out of desperation create an accident at one of the nuclear power plants in Ukraine? Remember, the Chernobyl was in Ukraine, is in Ukraine, in the north. What does Russia actually do? How does it respond? Uh, there is no other side to the story. Let, let, let's be clear. Russia is in the wrong here from the beginning. I have given you all sides of this, and I've given you the full analysis from day one. And in spite of it all, in spite of the fact that I've been right from day one, you know, let's wait six months. You know, six months ago, I said things would happen. They've happened pretty much the way I said they would. Let's see six months from now how they turn out. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to yourownbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one of those uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and of course subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.